Welcome, welcome, welcome. You are here by divine plan. I don't mean just for this show. You are on the earth for such a time as this in accordance with a divine plan that had been originated even before the foundations of the earth were laid. That's how spectacular your life is and how astonishing His will and purpose for your life truly is. You are here not by accident or coincidence, but by a divine appointment between you and the Holy Spirit, the Son of God, and the Father Himself. They have all worked to get us to this place in concert with one another. This is an appointed destiny. Now that may seem like overkill to some, but that's exactly what this moment in His plan is for all of us. So I want us to just dig in and get ready for a word from His very heart. Now, this is called an easy fix. That's what this little Bible study is about, an easy fix. We live in, we are a nation of fixers. We have self-help books and how to do it at home books, how to flip your own house, how to take walls out and put walls in. We have so many self-help books. But then we have the do-it-yourself TV channels that teach you how to do it, what to do, what tools to get, how to plan it out. That's just in, in the fixer-up things of our homes. Then we have psychologists and psychobabblers who spout and dish relational self-help to those of us who are at home watching on TV. We are a nation of fixers. We want to fix the economy. We want to fix the political climate in Washington. We want to fix our families. We want to fix one another. We want to fix ourselves. How many commercials are on TV about fixing yourself with cosmetics or weight loss or clothes or if you do this you'll look better if you feel if you buy this it'll be a better happier life we are a nation that wants to fix everything we are a nation that was born out of God's plan for us to help fix the world in regard to Jesus and the gospel message. But we've turned into a nation that just wants to fix everything, which is not a bad thing, but we're not called to do that. Because I have a, a notion that we're fixed on fixing things in a wrong way. God has a do-it-yourself self-help fixer-upper solution and it's called fixing ourselves on him we can't diy do it ourselves we cannot fix ourselves but god has the great do-it-yourself book of course we call it the bible but that's not even where i'm going today God just used that sense of fixing things, wanting to repair, wanting to make new, wanting to change on, on a scripture that he's spoken to my spirit about fixing our eyes on him. Because if we want to get fixed, this is how we do it. And when God laid this out for me, when it began, I thought to myself, I knew this. And I thought I had a grasp of what he was trying to teach me. But when I got through the end of it, I was so excited about what God had shown me about fixing our eyes or fixing ourselves on Him. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, a very famous verse. It says, looking or fixing our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand <clears throat> of the throne of God. <clears throat> Amen and hallelujah. We are to fix our eyes, fix our eyes unto Jesus. Now, we do that. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We sing that. It's a hymn called Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. But this is more than turning our eyes. This is fixing our gaze upon Jesus. But notice what the writer of Hebrews says. Jesus, comma, the author and finisher of our faith. 
This is great. This is exciting. We're to look to Jesus, to fix our eyes upon Jesus, who is going to begin and end the work in us, the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame that he might sit at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. So I took that thought that the Holy Spirit had placed within me about Jesus being, or looking, putting my gaze, fixing my eyes upon the author and finisher of my faith. You know, if I'm in a conversation with someone, a deep conversation, I'm going to look at them and be fixed upon them and give them my, my attention from the beginning of the conversation to the end of the conversation. When we are in a movie theater, we fix our eyes on the movie screen from the beginning of the previews and the end of the credits. We fix our eyes. We may take our eyes off for a second to grab some more popcorn or take a drink or move away or whatever. But God showed me that I fix my eyes on a lot of things from beginning to end. And God wants to show us through this study why we need to fix our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith. Now, the word fix means to turn away from other things or to attentively gaze on something. In other words, we're to call to turn our eyes away from something and turn them and focus them on Jesus. We're to turn our eyes away from distractions or trials or temptations and focus on the one true fixer and repairer of all things. That's how I'm going to go through this study. That's how I've received it into my own spirit, that I need to folk, take my focus and my eyes and my gaze off of things of this world and put them on the author and finisher of my faith. Now, aside from putting our eyes or focusing and fixing our eyes on Jesus, the scripture also says that we are to endure to the end. Jesus, when we fix our eyes upon him, it says that for the joy um, he that set before him, he endured the cross. We are to set our eyes on the one who for the joy set before him endured. In other words, we have to endure from author and finisher. From beginning to end, we must endure. Jesus was our perfect example of faith that he began a good work and he finished the good work of faith, of going to the cross. He began it and finished. He is the finisher and perfecter of all the work in our lives. So not only are we to look at the one who is the fixer and the repairer of all things, not just our eyes gazing and fixed upon him, but our hope fixed upon him. First Timothy 4.10 says it this way, for we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially to believers. We have fixed our hope on the living God, not a dead God, a risen, resurrected, living God. And our hope is fixed upon him. Now remember that word fixed means to turn away from something. We're to turn away from the things that we think bring us hope or to put hope in things or hope in people or situations or expectations. We are to fix our hope on the author and finisher, the living God. That's who we are supposed to hook our hope onto. Now, 1 Peter 1, verse 3 says it this way, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and fix your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not only do we fix our hope upon Him, but we fix our hope upon the grace that He gives us. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ. Nothing less no sinking sand, Jesus Christ, the one and only. That is where our hope is fixed upon. And not just upon his person, but upon what he gives us, which is absolute free grace. My hope is built on the grace that Jesus abundantly bestows upon me. I came across a scripture the other day, actually it's been a couple of weeks, that has just captured my heart. And it's Psalm 65, 11. And it says, when you walk in his way, and I'm paraphrasing, when you walk in his ways, when you follow the purpose and plan, 
from authorship to finisher, from beginning to end, when you walk in his ways. The Bible says in Psalm 65, verse 11, that his way drips with abundance. Trips with abundance. That so captured my heart and enamored me, my spirit, that if I'm in his way and allow him to just walk me through from beginning to end and I'm in his way and in his purposes and plans, then his way drips with absolute abundance. And that includes grace. I believe first and foremost, it includes grace. How do we prepare to gird our minds, because that's what 1 Peter 1, 3 said, to gird our minds, the loins of, loins of our minds, that we might be sober and fix our hope upon Jesus. Well, how do we do that? By focusing on Him. As we grow in the grace of holiness through our Lord, we are enabled by God's free grace to die more to ourselves and to, to die more to sin and to live more unto righteousness. We are called neither to fix our eyes on ourselves, to fix our eyes on past sin, to fix our eyes on temptation. We are to fix our eyes and fix our hope of being delivered out of it all on Jesus Christ himself. Our hope rests wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly in the grace of the Lord. That grace is available through the blood, the shed blood of Jesus. In fact, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 says that it's a grace that brings salvation. That grace that Jesus bestows upon us is the grace that brings salvation. Now, if we have any kind of understanding of salvation, we can understand it this way. We were saved from the penalty of our sin, saved by grace. From the penalty of sin, because the wages of sin is death. And we deserve death. But we have been saved from the penalty. That is, that is in a crazy, amazing thing. That's called justification. Big church word, justification. We're being saved from the power of sin daily. That is called sanctification. You see, we have already been spared the penalty of death because we're saved from the penalty. But now we're saved from the power of, of sin in our lives. And so that grace is still saving me moment by moment. It is saving each one of us by delivering out of, out of, out, us out of the power of sin over our lives. And one day, through the grace of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, what the book of Titus says is a, a grace unto salvation. We will be saved from the very presence of sin. We were saved from the penalty. We are being saved by the pow from the power. And now we're going to be, in, in, when we come to that full, the fullness of time, when our days on this earth are over and we are reunited with our Savior, we will be saved from the very presence of sin. That is called glorification. Justification sanctification, glorification, the penalty, the power, and the presence. It is an ongoing salvation, and that's where we hook our hope onto. Let me read it again. We, you, uh, we fix our hope fully upon the grace of Jesus that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we have this hope, not in ourselves, not in some what if, perhaps one day, but the sureness of Jesus Christ. But here's where it gets really, really amazing. We are committed to fix our hope on this living God, not a dead idol, but a living God who holds my life. That's what we're called to do. He is an exceedingly great God, supreme in all things, and He is alive. He is alive. Amen and amen. But not only do we fix our eyes and our hope, we fix who we become on him. You see, I, I, I spent a lot of years striving to become what I thought God wanted me to be. I spent a lot of years striving to become somebody that I thought people could honor or revere or respect. And, I, and God has shown me as I've grown older that those things don't matter. I don't need the applause of men. I don't need the acclaim of men. I need the applause and acclaim of my God and God alone. And so I stopped striving to be what I thought 
I needed to be. And I fixed my myself upon Jesus. Now, here's where the scriptures get so exciting. 1 John 3.3, 3, it says this. And everyone who has this hope fixed in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So this scripture says that if I have a hope, then if I fix my hope upon him, then I will be purified by him. Now the question would be in 1 John 3, 3, what is the hope? We find the answer one verse back in 1 John 3, 2. So let me read 1 John 3, 2 and then 3, 3. Beloved, I love being called the beloved of God. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. See, we don't know how we're going to turn out. We know we turn out great, but we've not seen it. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In other words, 1 John 3, 2 is telling us that we are the beloved of God and that it's, we don't even know how we're, I mean, we don't even understand how wonderful we're going to turn out, how amazingly beautiful and conformed in his image we are going to be when we are called home and says, we know, we know. Gnosko in the in the Greek and experience knowledge. It's not just a we think, it's we know, we know, we know that we know that we know. We know that when he is revealed, we will be like him. Then the next verse says, and everyone who has this hope, what hope? The hope that one day we will be like him. Everyone who has this hope fixed in him purifies himself just as he is pure. We will be like him. Looking to Jesus is not about looking, uh, you know, with our natural eyes. This is an amazing revelation to me that my, we're fixing our gaze, Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes upon Jesus. 1 Peter 1, 3, 1 Timothy 4, 10, fix our hope upon Jesus. And then you go, what hope? Well, 1 John chapter 3 tells us the hope is that one day we're going to be just like him. One day, Jenny Fister will look just like her Savior. One day, I will be in the exact image of a holy, perfect God. And anyone who has their hope fixed in him for this purpose is purified. In other words, I don't have to try to fix myself. I don't have, I don't need a self-help book. I don't need a do-it-yourself thing. I don't need a psychologist on, on, on TV. And I'm not talking about getting counseling. Counseling on, on, from a godly counselor is an amazingly powerful tool when you are needing in your emotions and your spirit someone to come alongside with you and guide you through some hard places. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the psychobabble that's out there that says, do these 10 steps and you're great. Do these five things and you'll be super. Follow this plan. Buy my book and you'll be different. You'll be changed. The only self-help do-it-yourself book you need is the Holy Bible itself. Because in it, it says you don't have to fix you. I don't have to fix me. I fix my eyes and my hope and myself on Jesus and he purifies me. He does the work. He is the best fixer-upper and repairer there is. Now, we don't look at him with natural eyes. This is not a looking for a picture or some statue of Jesus and putting my gaze upon it like it's something mystical and magical. No, this is the eyes of my heart. Paul says in, in Ephesians 1.18 that he prays the eyes of our heart might be enlightened, that they might be opened to see what God is doing for us in the spirit realm. That's what it means to fix my gaze, to fix my eyes upon Jesus. Not with these eyes but with these eyes, with a heart to just long after him and desire him, to meditate on his word, to pray and praise, to be around people who are like-minded and equally yoked in faith and understanding. That's what it means to fix our eyes upon him. To fix our, uh, this is how I wrote it, or the, how the Lord gave it to me. To fix my eyes on him is to believe the reality of 
who he is. It is to believe that what he has accomplished on my behalf is done on the cross and that he continues to work until the day of completion. Remember that, Hebrews 12, 2? Fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher, beginning to end. We have to stay focused on him. We become a church that focuses on business projects or building projects at church, colors of pews and carpets. Who's going to teach? Who's not going to teach? Who sings? What songs we choose? I don't like that kind of music. The pastor kind of stepped on my toes today. I don't like sitting next to that person. That person had too much perfume on. Do you see where our focus is? God says, if you want to get fixed, if you, if you want to be fixed up, fix your eyes on my son because he is the author and finisher, author and perfecter of your faith. And you will be like him when you focus solely on him. Now, here's how I have determined to fix my eyes on him. Three words. His power, his person, and his position. Now, I'm taking this out of uh, Psalm 46, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. And God showed me that this is how I can keep my focus on him. No matter what situations come up, no matter what circumstances come my way, or in, uh, where I find myself in some trouble, or some sadness, or sorrow, or even great joy, God said to me, use these three words as a place to hold on to. So this is Psalm 46, verses 8, 9, 10, 11. Here's 8 and 9. This is the power that I focus on, the power of God. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the battle bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Now, I taught this in a Bible study recently where Satan has a bow and he shoots darts at us. But God said that he has broken the bow of the enemy, the battle bow. That's the power of God. You see, I can, when, when there are troubles and trials in my life, I can focus on the power of God. And that's how I can glean my my hope in, in, the, in God's working in me is just to focus on his power. But then I can also focus on just who God is. Because the very next verse in Psalm 46, verse 10 says, Be still and know that I'm God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted above the in the earth. In other words, God says in verse 8 and 9, this is my power. I break the bow. I break the power of the enemy over you. That's the power of my God. But not just that. Remember who I am. I am God. I am the creator, the almighty, the El Shaddai, the beginning, the end, the Alpha Omega. He is all things for all times. He is the song of the night and the, the morning song. He is all of these amazing things. And God says, when you can't find my power or think about my power, just think about who I am, my person. But not only do I now I trust in his power or put my hope and fix my eyes on his on his person, but I'm reminded of his position. This is verse 11 it says the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. You see God's position is with me. He is in our midst. He is right here and I am in him. His power, his person, his position, all put together give me the hope that I can fix upon him. It gives me something to hold on to, to keep my eyes focused on him. He is a great fixer-upper for me, and I want him to be a fixer-upper for you. It's an easy fix. Don't try to do it yourself. We're a nation of wanting to do it ourselves, but this is the fixer-upper is, uh, is God fixing us up. Oh, Father, fix me as I fix my eyes on you. Amen, amen, and amen. Oh, folks, God loves you. Can I just say this? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the resurrected Messiah, Lord and Savior, loves you. I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm speaking to someone. Jesus loves you. He is not upset with you. He's not mad at you. He's not disappointed in you. He loves you. He went to the cross to demonstrate that love for you. And he wants you to love him in return. If you need help or prayer, give us a call at the ministry. 
get online, send us a prayer request, because he loves you in this beautiful picture. Amen. Introducing the new Zulon Press book, In Moments Like These, Volume 2, by Jenny Pfister. Moments Like These, Volume 2, is available at Christian bookstores and online. Purchase it today.